Welcome to Building Better Managers, the Better Manager podcast with Wendy Hansen, where we talk with top leadership professionals about strategies you can use today to create a happier, highly engaged, and more productive workplace. Now, here's your host, Better Manager co-founder, Wendy Hansen. Today, I am honored to have Katie Sullivan with me. Katie is the Senior Vice President at Yelp, currently running Yelp's customer success team. She's in charge of all the recurring revenue to the company, and that's estimated to be nearly $1 billion this year. She started in the company over 10 years ago as a frontline salesperson and managed sales and go-to-market teams all over the U.S. and Western Europe. In addition to her experience at Yelp, She works as an active advisor for a few startups and a few side projects related to furthering women in business and leadership. Katie lives in Mill Valley with her entrepreneur husband and nine-month-old baby Axel. She's a passionate cyclist, avid reader, and lover of travel. Please welcome to the show, Katie Sullivan. Hi, Katie. It's so great to have you on the show today. Thank you for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Oh, well, I loved when we were talking about lead more and do less. I thought that would be a great theme for today because you have a lot of wisdom on that that you could share. So we (laughs) find. Yes. So tell me a little bit, where did that come up? Lead more and do less. Yeah, so it actually came from a one-on-one that I had with our CFO, who's become a bit of a mentor to me in the last kind of 18 months or so. Um, And he's seen me do a lot of big things and interesting projects at the company. Um, And I've recently taken on something that is uh, a bit more strategic and and requires a lot more working with different stakeholders. Um, Now, I am a very, very high energy person. Uh, I need to keep myself very, very stimulated. Otherwise, I go a little bit nuts, Um, which generally I think has been a good thing in my personality and my career, Um, but can sometimes be a bit of a double-edged sword because, uh, you know, while it means I can sustain a high work pace for a long period of time, it also means that I sort of feel the need to constantly be busy and that's not always a good thing. So. I was in a one-on-one with, uh, with our CFO and he said to me, I was talking to him about kind of like needing to keep myself a little bit busier. And he said, or maybe you need to lead more and do less. And I'd heard of the concept before, uh, like in my early management career, but for some reason it just really struck me this time around. Um, and it really resonated with just where I am in my current projects and my current work. Um, and it, it struck a tone of, um, kind of capturing what leadership is all about. Uh, and, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about how what's old is new again. And I think this was one of my earliest leadership and management lessons. I think I learned pretty quickly that you can't kind of get in and try to pace set with your employees. You can't just get in there and try to do everything with and for your employees, but that the best managers instead are really capable of understanding what needs to get done and leading people to that outcome as opposed to trying to do more for them. Um, so anyway, this, this concept, it was so well stated the way that Lanny, our CFO, said it, lead more, do less. Uh, it really resonated with me, and, and I've been trying to really focus on how I can be busy with leading as opposed to busy with busy work. Yeah. And that, I love that that struck you and it's something, it's like a mantra you can keep in your head. Oh, how am I doing today? Leading more, doing less. Yeah. And And what does that look like? Like the difference between what, what, what were some of the things that happened after you kind of got that thought? Yeah, I think um, a couple things. One, when I would find myself sucked into doing something very tactical, for example, managing my inbox, which is the classic thorn in the side that a lot of people feel on a consistent basis. I would ask myself, am I leading more by doing this activity? Um, And, you know, very often I would find myself drawn into these activities where I would realize, no, I'm not leading more. I'm just kind of like cycling through to get things done to feel busy. Um, And I sort of realized that some of those things you still need to get done, like managing your inbox, uh, but instead allocating 30 minutes in the morning where you're just going to get that done and then actually prioritize a much meatier task that's going to require a lot more thought that's going to be a little bit hairier and more difficult to get into 
is a much better use of my time rather than spending two hours managing my inbox. Yeah. And I think that's such a great lesson for any manager, any even team member. You know, we don't take time. A better manager, we do our map survey. We ask a question, how often do you take time to reflect? And I, and I think we're at about 80% of people say never. Yeah. When we talk about reflection is that kind of standing back and having some kind of mantra to say, am, am I leading in this case or am I just doing? Totally. What, give me the biggest bang for the buck here. Absolutely. How am I going to make the biggest you know, impact on the organization and on my team? Yep, yep. And it's what? easy not it's easy to to skip over those reflection points because we are so busy and there's so much to do, both at work and our lives. And you know, it's easy to say, like, oh, I hit my four things on my to-do list as opposed to I hit my two priorities is a very different concept. Yeah. When you focus on this, what is the impact on the people that you manage? Because, you know, that's how people learn how to manage, by looking up and, and, and they're getting some great lessons from you here. How is that showing up? Yeah, I think, um, I think one that jumps to mind immediately is thought leadership. Uh, I think particularly if you're in a place in your career where you're managing and leading cross-functionally and you're not just leading only your group of people, but you're influencing many different groups of people, some of which you may not actually be an owner of, but just an influencer of. Um, it's really important to bring that thought leadership to the table uh, and allow groups of multiple perspectives to think and digest and debate. Um, And I think great leaders have the ability to bring thought leadership to all different, uh, both across, up and down within their organizations um, and help like co or or I guess guide and and bring together disparate groups who might have different viewpoints and different projects and different ways that they're working on the business and bring them coalesced around one thought uh, so that everybody can move forward in a cohesive manner. Yeah, that's great. I love that concept. And we talk about it in coaching, a lot of co-creation, you know, when you have two people together and you do that so well across the organization and bring excitement in and how do we look at this together? And, And you don't need to own things to make change. Totally. And you can lead by any seat on the bus. You know, that's what people need to realize in organizations, no matter where you are. Or as I like to say, uh, you don't need a manager title to be a leader. Yes, that's great. That's great. One of the things that you and I have talked about a lot, too, is vision. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes we just get into tasks. This kind of goes back to lead more, do less, right? Without really a vision or painting the picture for people of what it Mm -hmm. is. How does that show up in your work and how, how does that impact you? Yeah, that's a great question. I definitely am a big advocate of, of leadership with vision and kind of bringing a vision to your team. And I kind of think about it in three different ways. There's um, piece number one, which is where are we going, which I think inevitably everybody wants to understand if they're part of a team, no matter what part of the team you are. And our brain needs to know that from a neuroscience standpoint. If we don't know where we're going, we're really going to kind of circle. Yeah, exactly. So where are we going? I think piece number two is I think vision for your team. If you're a manager or a leader, you actually really have to have a vision for each individual on your team. And I think piece number three uh, that relates to vision is uh, keeping the big picture in mind and, and context. So I'll elaborate a little bit on each of them. To the first point on where are we going, um, I really do believe that people need a beacon to be working towards. Um, and that's why we have milestones and goals. That's why people love New Year's resolutions. And you know, generally speaking, most people in business really want that direction. Um, and your job as the leader is to provide that for people, uh, regardless of how senior or how large or how small your team is, like you might be managing a team of two, you still need to provide vision to that team of two. You might be yeah. A department of 6,000, you need to provide that vision for them. So I, I really try to make it a point at least once a quarter, uh, if not more frequently, but once a quarter, sort of like my bare minimum, um, to set aside time to think for our previous conversation about reflecting uh, about where we're going. And that requires sometimes a lot of work. Sometimes I, I myself am kind of lost in the forest and I need to kind of stop and think. And sometimes that means I need to talk to stakeholders or talk to my team to gather input on the vision. Other times it's like clear as day to me. I set aside, you know, 45 minutes to think about it within five minutes. I'm like, I know what our vision is. I know where we're going. So it's not always clear, but sometimes it is. 
Um, but the main point is that at least once a quarter, you're spending time gathering the appropriate inputs um, and coming up with and truly articulating, ideally in like a very memorable or pithy way, what that vision is, and then spending time communicating that to your team um, and to the people. So I think that's piece one on, on where are we going. Uh, on piece two, which is the um, your vision for your people, I, I had a previous colleague here at Yelp, a guy named Pete Hancock. Uh, he had this awesome mantra that I have borrowed from him that I love, which is give your people a reputation to live up to. And I loved that because right away, I had sort of said it early on in my management career. And right away, I had somebody on my team who was like decently hardworking, but not necessarily the hardest working guy in the room. But I could see that he had it in him. He just had a tough time like getting focused and, you know, kind of accomplishing what, what I thought he was capable of accomplishing. So I sat down with him and I said, I think you have the capacity to be the hardest working person on this team. And then, you know, started talking him through what I thought that meant and asking him if he believed in it and yada, yada, yada. Fast forward six months, you know, I had been like sitting at our pod with our team. I kept saying, you know, there's John Smith, the hardest working person on this team. And sure enough, you fast forward six months and he was the hardest working person on the team. His output metrics far surpassed anybody else. And I think people want to have a high standard and a vision to live up to. And I think you as a leader, it's really important to be able to see the best potential in people and help draw that out of them. I think giving people a vision for themselves and telling them what you see is a really enabling and powerful way to do that. I just love that. And and can, there's another side of that coin too. When you see somebody as they are going to be the best leader, they are creative and resourceful at what they do. We collect evidence that they are. Yes. If you say, oh, this person is really a loser. They're never going to make anything on this team. You're going to collect evidence and you're going to increase them. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And that shows through in tiny ways. You and I talked about in one of our uh, previous conversations, uh, that study that I had uh, listened to about on uh, the podcast on Invisibilia, where they talked about um, this study with mice, where essentially a set of mice were going through a maze. And on one set of the mice, uh, the researchers saw a sign that said, caution, these mice are very dumb. And then on the second um, you know, set of, of mice, there was a little sign on the cage that said, caution, these mice are extremely intelligent. And sure enough, the extremely intelligent mice outperformed the dumb mice in every way. They got to the end of the maze faster They, you know, whatever, all the different measurements. Um, and so the podcast host started asking, like, how could this be? There's surely there's no difference between the mice, right? Uh, and there was no difference between the mice. Um, and what they discovered was when the researchers held a belief in their minds, that came out in tiny ways, how they handled the mice, whether they were gentle or rough with the mice, uh, little tiny biases and how they evaluated their performance. I think that's true of management. If you don't believe in somebody, people can sense it. There's, you can fake it all you want, but like humans are very intelligent social creatures and they can pick it up. And I do really believe that it is your obligation as a leader to spend the time to get to know somebody until you get to a point where you can see the best in them. And it's sometimes it comes easily and sometimes it comes with a lot of work, but it's really, really important to do. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I love that. And you had one more point on the Uh, business. Yes. The third point was, and this, I'm a big, big, big believer and advocate of this is always keeping the big picture in mind. Um, and so, you know, I think as a leader, you have to give this both to your people, but also to your peers and to yourself and even to your superiors sometimes. Um, you know, I famously gave a talk like four or five years ago at Yelp where I showed a series of stars and planets next to each other. So, you know, it started with the moon, then the moon next to the earth, and then the earth next to larger planets in the solar system, and then those next to the sun, and then the sun next to some of the largest planets in our, or sorry, the largest um, stars in our solar system. And I sort of gave this analogy around how like the work you're doing probably feels like earth probably feels like everything to you. Um, And then when you look up and you realize that, oh, there's other planets in the solar system. And then you look up and you say, oh, we're all powered by the sun in this solar system. And then you look up and you realize that we're just one solar system and an entire galaxy uh, and sort of compared our work to that. And that that meme has been sort of promulgated throughout the company since then. Um, But I think that keeping that big picture context and understanding that we are all one, uh, we are all one small part 
of an entire system that's working together. It's really easy to believe that your work or your struggles or your stresses are the most important or are dominating your kind of amygdala or your brain uh, over the course of that day. And it, it's that, bra- that greater context that kind of allows you to see the bigger picture and relax and understand where you are. And I think it's a great stress reliever. And I think it's a really great way to kind of like understand how you fit into a business, into a company, what, what work you do, how it matters. And in some case, like not in a bad way, but sometimes how it actually doesn't matter. And so don't freak yourself out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. Don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. This is it. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Like missing the sales number. Yeah. Like you're missing the sales number. Or you pushed a line of code live and there was an error in it or something and you can panic and lose sleep for night after night after night. And you realize in the scheme of things, like when you're 50 or 60 or 70 and you're getting to retire, you're probably not going to look back and say like, don't remember that one time when I pushed code and it was incorrect. Like yeah. probably not. And that context is really important to keep in mind. It's all about learning from your mistake and moving on. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to, we're not saving lives, you know, like we're not, you know, babies are not at risk. Right. If something goes wrong at this. And this Unless is. Unless you're listening yeah. to this podcast and you work in the NICU, you're yeah. saying. If you're in the NICU, we want you to do <laughs> that. Are high. Code or something else. Not good. Yeah. It's all going to exactly. be. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you've been at Yelp for 10 years. God, you came in as, as in sales and now look at where you are 10 years later. You have lots of lessons and you know, you're in charge of so much of this recurring revenue, $1 billion, lots of responsibility. My God, what, what advice would you give to like new managers coming in? Like things that you say, wow, you got some good advice early on, you know, from people that really you've hold, held with you. Yep. What would you share with some new leaders who are coming up? Yeah, that's great. Um, I mean, too many things to even think about on this podcast. <laughs> I write a book about that. But yeah. um, there's, so there's, not, there's, yes. there's a big industry of books on leadership. Um, I would say a couple of the more memorable ones, and especially ones that are applicable if you're kind of in the first like two to five years of your management career, um, would be number one, the team takes the tone of its leader. That was something that my very first sales director, uh, when I became a sales manager, used to repeat over and over again. The team takes the tone of its leader. Uh, And boy, oh boy, is that true. And so I used to have moments when um, I would, you know, kind of be going home that night. Maybe I'd have been having a not great day or week. And I'd say, oh, my team is so blank, like fill in the blank here. My team's been so lackluster this week. Or, you know, my team's just like not holding themselves to a high standard this week. And then I'd sort of stop and ask myself, I'd say, team takes a tone of its leader. Am I lackluster this week? Am I not holding myself to a high standard this week? Um, And it was a really great way to understand how like kind of there is an I in team um, (laughs) as a leader. And I think how important the tone that you set for your team is and, you know, how much ownership you actually have over everything from their, the vocabulary they use to talk about the company and their jobs and, and, you know, it's like when I hang around with my three-year-old niece and I, she says the word crap. And I think to myself, where did she learn that? And I realized, oh my God, I'm the one who said crap. In the first. Um, but you know, your, your team is like that. You are their leader. They are going to internalize your vocabulary. They're going to model what you do. And yeah. Exactly. And if you so, come in and your energy, like you are naturally high energy, which is sure. such a gift to your team. But if somebody comes in and says, I'm just not feeling it today. It's totally. Like, Whoa. I mean, when I, when I was starting to train new managers, The first thing I used to say is like the first five minutes of your day are some of the most important of your day. When somebody walks to their desk, do you put your head down and ignore them? Or do you look look up and say, good morning, Susie, how are you doing today? That in and of itself really, really matters. Um, And so I do really think that that's a critical kind of early lesson in leadership. Um, You know, another one is always explain the why. Um, this, I mean, so many of the things that I believe in in leadership, I've borrowed and stolen from other great thought leaders. Um, and this was a Simon Sinek Ted talk that I saw ages ago. I mean, right. like maybe Which even. will never get old. I, we use it all the time because it is, if you understand the why it's kind of the vision piece, right? And exactly. Like the GPS piece. Yeah. And it's such a different thing to say, you know, Hey, we've made changes to the compensation system or making changes to the product. Here's what it is. That just leaves all this room for like, wait, this is the change. I don't like the change. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the change. 
versus if you say, this is what it is. Here's why we, we made it that way. Here's some of the other things that we considered, but we made the change this because of X, Y, and Z. Then you just, it's so much easier for people to go home, lay their head on their pillow and understand and not worry about it and focus on the task at hand. Yeah. And they may not always agree, but if they knew the why, they can oh, understand. Now I get this. I can buy in. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. That's awesome. Then I would say the, the third lesson that I think uh, is great for people in, in their first few years of management is kind of ties into our previous conversation about um, setting a vision for people. And it's that you have to believe in people. Uh, and, you know, it's, it can be easier and harder to do. I've had thousands of people on my teams. Um, and sometimes it's really easy. I see somebody and right away we have a connection and I see the best in them. Um, and sometimes it's harder to do. I, I don't have that immediate connection or I have a raised eyebrow or a question mark about them, but I really believe that it's my obligation to keep having the conversations with that person in order to get to that point where I truly believe in them. Uh, because it is just incredible what people can accomplish. Uh, and you know, I know that we live in an era where, People are trying to, and companies would love to replace as many people with machines as possible because it's less expensive, et cetera. But there's even, even the machines, there's people behind the machines, making those yeah. machines, writing those algorithms. And I, you know, you're never going to get away from just how important people and their motivations and their inspiration are and just how much those people can accomplish. Yeah. When someone believes in them. Yeah. When we appreciate, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about this too, appreciation, recognition, gratitude. Yeah. Just to think, oh, that's kind of fluffy, you know? Totally. Okay. No, it builds yep. capacity. It builds capacity. It turns out if business was just taking what was on a spreadsheet and executing on it, everybody would be really good at business. But right. not everybody The is. human factor gets very complicated. Yeah. Exactly. And we have to hold what we really believe in. Yes. So my last question because I just admire you so much. I admire the fact that you are such a leader in business, but in a women leader in business and a mom, lucky little Axel, he's got a mom that's out there making a difference in the world. <laughs> As you look at this, and I think this, all of us have to do this. What do we want our legacy to be? Mm-hmm. Like, what do we, you know, as we get to the end and we're looking back, like we talked about, don't sweat the small stuff. It's not, right. that. what do you want your legacy to be, Katie? So I think, uh, two things. I think if you would have asked me this like five years ago, I would have had one answer, which still remains true. And I think now um, I probably have a little bit more added on to it. But I, I would say first and foremost is, and I used to talk about this with employees. Um, I think about you know, when I'm like 90 and I'm sitting on a rocking chair on my porch, hopefully like well, enjoying- you're riding a surfboard. I don't, I don't get the, the, the you at night. Riding a surfboard, yeah. drinking a cocktail, <laughs> who knows which. Um, but you know, when I'm sort of like looking back on my life and hopefully I've got grandkids or great grandkids, um, I want to be able to point to something in the world, point to it and say, I helped build that. And so for a long time, that's been what's fueled my desire to continue to contribute to growing Yelp is I really believe in our mission. I really love the company. um, And I want to be able to look back and say, like, look at at that thing that I helped build. And it was influential in our society. Um, I would say the things that have added on to that are twofold. One is I'm really motivated by hopefully creating life-changing experiences and events for the people who work for me. So whether that be financial or career opportunities, like somebody just give somebody a shot, you know, even though they might only be five years into their management career, put them in the biggest job they've ever had and accelerate their career. And they look back when they're, you know, 90 and they say, wow, that moment in time, like Katie really believed in me and gave me that opportunity. Um, that's really motivating to me is, is the idea of like having some life changing events for people who work for me. Um, and then additionally, I, now that I have a kid, it's so cliche to say, but I think a lot about like what kind of a role model and what kind of, um, I guess model I I set for my son. Uh, and, and I think about when he's in school and when he goes to college or doesn't go to college, I don't know. You never know 18 years from now. Um, but when he kind of goes out into the world, when he's a grown up. I want to make sure that I'm living a life today that when he talks about me, he can feel like he has something that, that 
my mom is a badass. My mom was an incredible leader. My mom, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I want to, I want a legacy for him as well. So, and I'm sure that that will continue to evolve and change over the course of my life. And, you know, as I have more kids and kids get older and all that and more career experience, but I would say as of today, those are kind of the, the, the two to three things that are most important to me. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And it's wonderful to think of your son and the stories that he will tell about his mom that are yet to be, you know, and what he learns and how he learns about women leaders. Like, that's why you're such a great role model for that how really competent and out in the world and things. And hopefully we're not going to struggle with this in 18 years. It will just be a big given where now it's not. Yes. Fingers (laughs) crossed. This will not be a podcast 18 years from now. Yes. yes. 18 years from now. Remember when, remember when there was even a question about women in leadership or equality of uh, how we treat them? Giving more opportunities. And, you know, that's why I love that you're also working with startups and you're, you're advising and mentoring, you know, that's part of your legacy too. And outside of other businesses also. Yeah, absolutely. That's just terrific. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom today. And uh, of course, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And uh, we'll be in touch. So thank you. Take care. All right. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye. For more information, show notes, and any downloads for today's podcast, please visit us at bettermanager.us slash podcast. Be sure to join us again and help us continue to build better managers with another insightful interview.